Man, I can't believe he's not broke down on the highway. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular afternoon council meeting of Monday, June the 28th. This meeting is being recorded live and is streaming on the District of Summerland YouTube channel, youtube.com, District of Summerland. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public may access the meeting or participate in the following ways. You can watch the meeting live or recorded, again, at the Summerland District of Summerland YouTube channel. If you wish to speak during the meeting and have not registered in advance, uh, you may connect to the meeting by calling the conference line at 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506 Four eight nine nine three seven four and passcode four eight five one eight six. After I have provided everyone who is pre-registered with an opportunity to comment, the floor will be open to those on the conference line. Corporate officer, do we have any late items? There are none, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Could I have someone bring forward the agenda? Thank you, Councillor Trainer and Councillor Barkwell. All in favor? Okay, thank you. Oh, I have to remember to look at Councillor Patton too. Uh, An adoption of the minutes for June the 10th, our special council meeting and June the 14th, regular afternoon council meeting. Councillor Trainer, thank you. And again, Councillor Barkwell, all in favor? Thank you. Okay, on to delegations. We have one delegation today. Thank you for waiting um, an extra two weeks. That's with the South Okanagan Immigration, sorry, Immigrant and Community Services. And uh, we have um, Katerina, Cherry, and Elmira here. Um, and they are going to talk to us about some of the different programs that they have. And um, then we'll have the opportunity to engage with them and ask questions. So please go ahead, whoever's leading that. Hello. Thank you, Mayor Tony Boot and Council for giving us this opportunity to come and speak with you today. Uh, my name is Cherry Fernandez. I am the Executive Director of the South Okanagan Immigrant and Community Services. And I am joined here today by my colleagues, Michael, Elmira, and Katerina. And if I can, I will just share my screen for a moment. Go. Okay. So before we get started, I, I would like to acknowledge that we are joining you from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Silk people of the Okanagan Nation. So the South Okanagan Immigrant and Community Services is an immigrant serving organization providing settlement and integration services to the South Okanagan Sinlokanin area. Um, our core services are listed here on the screen and um, we provide them to support uh, or we support permanent residents, naturalized Canadians, temporary foreign workers and post-secondary international students. On April 4th, 2020, the immigrant serving sector was deemed an essential service industry. For SOIX, that meant um, in this past year that we had to quickly transition um, to ensure that our services remain responsive and accessible as many businesses ha have had to do over the past year. For us, that meant providing orientation and training on new technologies and online platforms. It also meant hosting one-on-one -on -one homework club to support home-based learning for newcomer families. Um, it also included intergenerational programming to really mitigate the isolation that a number of our seniors, youth, and children face during this time. 
And in a year of racial tensions, it meant celebrating the diversity of our region with our very first virtual One World Festival. Despite the slowing of Canada's population due to border closures, we learned a new way to interact and connect with newcomers to our region, really increasing our accessibility. As you see here, we provided 13,175 services to our region, which really accounted for 1,872 clients. Um, representing 105 different countries and territories of origin. Today, we have two programs that we'd like to highlight for you. The first coming from our local immigration partnership. So I will pass that on to Elmira now. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you, everyone, for having us. My name is Elmira. I'm the coordinator of the local immigration partnership. Um, Local Immigration Partnership is a partnership project, partnership table, that includes local governments, school boards, community organizations, employers, that all come together to create uh, a strategy for successful immigrant integration. We have a number of projects, Cherry, sorry. Next yes. slide, please. Uh, right. Next slide. <laughs> we have a number of projects. Um, no. Could you go back, please? One. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And today I, I wanted to highlight just one uh, in the interest of time. We, we do research, we uh, look into newcomer needs and employer needs. We create resources for employers. And one of the projects that were recently started is called Workplace Equity and Inclusion. And we're working with a few employers uh, since it's a pilot and hoping to expand it. But the idea is to contribute to creating more diverse and inclusive workplaces by supporting employers for training, um, templates for policies, and various resources. So, And we're using a broader definition of diversity here. So we include immigrants, the indigenous community, people that have disabilities, LGBTQ2S plus community, uh, seniors and women as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, we're hoping that uh, for increased diversity and inclusion will improve business outcomes for employers, which is talent attraction, employee commitment and productivity, as well as market uh, expansion, which will lead ultimately to labor, improved labor uh, outcomes for the region as a whole. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. So changing the gears slightly, I'd like to familiarize you with the One World Youth Group. So we are a youth navigated program that is facilitated by SOICS with the focus to create inclusive and welcoming communities in the south of Kanagan. Um, who are we? So just the next step. Yeah, thank you. Um, youth have the liberty to choose their own projects and decide what to implement or showcase. So generally, every six months or so, the group aims to complete a project that will benefit the community in some way. So how do we benefit the community? So besides youth gaining valuable volunteer hours, the chance to enhance your resume, gaining skills by participating in a variety of different workshops, there's also the opportunity to contribute and actually be active members in the communities along with the greater region. So activities such as art-based uh, media projects along with a lot of multicultural learning uh, the youth crew adds to our communities by promoting both inclusion and diversity. An example of this initiative that I'd like to share is um, the One World Youth Crew Vandalism Reporting Tool. So it's a project that's rooted from noticing an increase in graffiti and vandalism primarily related to race. And the youth group began to explore ways to reduce vandalism and property damage. And the idea was named Project Vandal. Over the course of several months, we explored ways um, of the removal, which led to the idea of an online reporting system. And throughout COVID, we virtually collaborated and um, developed, along with other things, this explainer video here on the slide. And 
Um, we know that each community does have a strategy in place around graffiti, but we would like to know as a youth group how we can support and or add to your efforts. So, for example, from the online reporting tool, um, and once we get the data, is there a way that we can share this? So, for example, to show if the majority of the graffiti is around age, gender, or race. So, either through the collection of data, the reporting tool itself, we'd like to know what we can further do to our support community. Another initiative that I'd like to share on the last note is um, our mural project. So we have painted an Okanagan inspired mural in the back of the Soix office, but it's a true goal of the youth crew to see more murals in the communities. Right now, um, we actually are collaborating with Summerland, so we hope to see that come true. And we'd like to make more connections around our region to where more youth reside, as it's a great way to come together put something forth collectively and um, ultimately reduce vandalism. And just this next slide here, if you guys get a chance to review the materials, there's all of our links, uh, the reporting tool, the explainer video. Thank you. Thank you. So with everything we do, with all our projects and our programming, diversity and inclusion is really inherent within all of that. So within our settlement services, our local immigration partnership and the One World Youth Crew, which you have heard about today. Uh, it also is involved with our RESPECT network. Um, with this project in particular, this network, we're working with communities to really um, address anti or anti-racism initiatives. In Summerland in particular, we are working with, as Katarina has mentioned, with Abby, Abby Leakey, a Summerland resident, to provide a mural on diversity in Summerland. Uh, we are also partnering with the library to pilot an, an unbox project, which really takes participants through individually to, to explore racism and what they can do as allies. And with the Summerland Museum, we are working to bring forward immigrant stories and stories of vulnerable populations and bring it to, to the community and show really the diversity that is in Summerland. This past year, which was truly a collaborative project, um, we really had to look at ways to communicate with the community. And because of all the tensions, the racial tensions, we wanted to provide a positive me message um, of really finding strength within our diversity. So between the SOIX team, our youth crew, and with the support of our local chambers of commerce, we picked up a camera and through trial and error, um, we're able to bring this message forward. Uh, the stories and the sorry, not the stories, but the, the voices that you hear here and the examples are really from our community. Um, and the successes too, uh, really the contribution, they are from our community as well. So I will share that in a moment. And it really started from a question that my own daughter asked at three years old when she asked me the question, mommy, do you like being brown? Which resulted in the video I'm about to show, share with you now. Mommy, 
looking down. Baby, what do you see? I see you, Mommy. What do you see? My accent, my culture, my appearance, my name. This is not my old story. I am your neighbor. I build your home and workplaces. I make sure your spaces are clean and safe. I grow your food. I bring your food to you. I am an employer. I am business owner. I create jobs. I help you manage your kitchen. I celebrate art. I give back to the community. I care for you. I am a lifesaver. I provide guidance. I listen and offer comfort. I am a teacher. I empower the next generation. I create innovation. I am Cam Loops. I am Salmon Arm. I am Vernon. I am Kilogram. I am Pitchland. I am Summerland. I am Tentictin. I am Oliver. I am the Swiss. I see you. I am Martin. Father. Sister, my brother, daughter, son, Linda, friend. I am your neighbor. I am your neighbor. I am your neighbor. I am your neighbor. I, am your neighbor. I see you. Mommy, you want me to come Baby, I'm proud to be brown. But I am not alone. You are not alone. This is our community. These are our neighbors. Neighbors that will not be silent, but take a stand and make us stronger together. Color makes life beautiful. We are all connected. Our diversity makes us stronger together. Why fear our differences? Instead, share, learn, and appreciate the strength we have in our connection. To those that lift us up in times of crisis and uncertainty. To those that do their part every day where we work, learn, play, and live. To those that recognize and value our connection. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Terry. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Lamont, and I'm the program facilitator for the One World Youth Crew. Um, it's our hope that this video will act as a launch pad to respond to racism in all of the communities in our region. Um, and it's really part of a larger approach. Um, we're using a combination of strategies to communicate uh, 
our anti-racism activities from the video that you just saw to the uh, project vandal graffiti reporting tool. Uh, we would love to support your community and your efforts. And if we are able to share data or find a way to um, use the data uh, to help your own efforts, uh, we'd like to get in contact and um, start working together. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, we, we'd love to have a conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Cherry, and all for your um, presentation. Uh, I can't count the number of times I've seen that video. It's still such an amazing video. So thank you for showing it again to us. Uh, Councillor, are there any questions? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much for your presentation and thank you for that video. That is amazing. Um, I don't mean to sound naive. Is that video being put all over social media? It is. Thank you so much. And we can share the link with you. We do have it on all social media platforms that we're, we're participating in. And we're very happy if you can share it with your network as well. Is there a way of increasing the volume for the folks on Zoom? It's hard to hear you, Cherry. Oh, OK. Can, can you hear me if I go closer somehow? <laughs> That's a Are little you, bit better. A bit better? Okay. I, I was just saying we do have that video on all our social media platforms and we can share it again as well. And if you can share it within your networks, we, we'd very much appreciate that. Great. Thank you. Councillor Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, a question for uh, Elmira, if, if I may. I'm just wondering, does the District of Summerlin have any representation on the LA, on the LIP? L uh, the local immigration partnership. Yes, actually we do. Uh, Maya Boot is uh, one of the members at, of the local immigration partnership. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And Thank you. May I ask, uh, Cherry, uh, who is the new SOIGS president? I'm very curious. <laughs> it's uh, Bruce Taz. He, he was uh, formerly a volunteer of SOAX um, and heavily involved in a number of our programs. So we're very happy to welcome him as our new president. Good, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, oh, Councillor Van Elfen. Just one quick question, if I may, Madam Mayor. And I, it's not in my wheelhouse, so to speak, but is this video obvious? You've shared this with School District 67. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Mayor. And just for Council's awareness also, I've shared that video with all staff in the organization and asked them to take time to view it. I have one question about the um, Project Vandal with the One World Youth Crew. Once um, some graffiti is identified and located, what happens then? What's the process for removal or to address that? If Michael, do you mind if oh, I? For sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the process is different for each region. Um, we would report to uh, the, 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 the municipality or regional district first because some areas are already supported through um, a third party company. Um, in the event that there isn't already some kind of support, we could work with the property owner to find other solutions um, and uh, work on a case by case basis based on the location and the based on the location of the graffiti geographically in the region, and then also the physical location within that community. And I think as well here today, we're hoping that we can 
um, build that connection so that we have a contact person. So when we do have these reports come in, we're able to share that immediately, as well as a collective data um, at the end of the year, we can also share that. Do you have any um, members of the youth crew in that live in Summerland? Yes, we have one member that lives in Summerland currently. Yes. And so if there is uh, graffiti identified somewhere in Summerland, um, is, is that what you're looking for, Cherry? Is somebody that could be contacted? Yes. yes. So someone that our youth crew can then go to the municipalities or the the organization that is responsible really for the removal and and kind of share that information as well as a collective um, information that they have if they can share it with the municipalities as well if they would find that useful thank you graham is that something yes so our cao graham stat um he's like the chief of staff here and certainly um uh, head of the uh, works in utilities, <laughs> works in infrastructure, so uh, he could be the point person and then um, get, get, take care of it that way. So thanks for thanks for asking that. Thank you. However, we can help. Councillor uh, Van Elfen has another comment. Just a question through to staff, if I may, Madam Mayor, is there a possibility that we could have a link to that video on our website? on our district website uh, through the mayor yeah i think that's a great idea and we certainly can do that we will action that out of today's meeting thank you thank you i think it was on our social media at one point but not that it made it to our website so that would be great thank you for bringing that forward councillor van elfen Okay, and maybe even a post on social media just to say, just to direct people to the website. Good, okay, any other comments or questions? Right, I, I will thank you again on behalf of council and staff for um, taking the time to present to us today. And again, thank you for um, giving up your spot earlier in the year and uh, bringing your presentation to us today when we could have a longer time to meet. So thank you so much for bringing us up to date on what you're doing. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, any, um, anybody that wants to speak at the public comment opportunity? No. Don't know why I always ask that, except that I have to. Okay, so on to uh, the first of the several business items, 7.1 Beach Vanding License of Occupation. And I have, oh yeah, Lori is here. Okay, I thought that maybe you were gone already. So please go ahead, Lori. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the purpose of this report is for Council to consider and provide staff authorization to process beach vending applications for Peach Orchard, Rotary, and Powell Beaches, and to approve the seasonal fee of $700. The beach vending program was offered in 2018 with three vendors and 2019 with two vendors. And due to COVID-19, no vending took place in 2020. Historically, the fee was negotiated rate and approval was required by Council each year. The beach vending locations include two locations at Peach Orchard Beach parking lot, two locations at the Rotary parking lot, and three locations at the Powell Beach parking lot. Staff came forward at the June 14th uh, council meeting with a recommendation that the fees and charges amendment bylaw include an addition of Schedule U mobile beach vending permit fee of $700, which would provide staff authorization to, change, to charge this fee on approved applications. As council deferred this report to the De Development Process Improvement Committee for input, staff are bringing forward this report to process the beach vending applications in time for summer. 
This would provide staff authorization to issue license of occupation agreements and charge the permit fee of $700 uh, for this season until the bylaw has been amended with Schedule U. After the bylaw amendment has been approved, the $700 mobile beach vending fee will officially be applicable. The beach vending locations will remain the same as previous years. Interested vendors will complete an application process and staff will approve about three to four vendors for this year to occupy any of the approved locations on a first come first available basis each morning. Vendors may vend at any of the five designated locations and move around uh, throughout the season. Staff are recommending the seasonal permit fee of $700, which is the same rate that was charged in 2019. While this fee is on the low side of comparison communities, staff note that increasing the fee may deter interest. Currently, there is one application which was submitted uh, a few weeks ago, and that is for a snow cone cart, uh, which would be operated by three local summer land youth. Uh, so that uh, concludes my report, Council, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laurie. Council, any questions? Um, could I, I, if I could just ask one of Brad, I see that you're here, Brad. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'll make the assumption that uh, this wasn't on the last um, development and pro, uh, process improvement advisory committee meeting agenda. Um, is it going to be on the next one? Uh, no, the bylaw uh, in its in total form was presented to the last uh, committee okay. meeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I didn't see anything in the in the minutes that um, suggested that there was any issue with this. So um, thank you for that. Yeah, no concerns. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I will. Um, what will I ask for? I'll have someone bring forward the motion that's there, please. Anyone? Councillor Trainer. Um, I will bring forward that staff be authorized to process beach vending applications for Peach Orchard, Rotary, and Powell beaches and approve the seasonal fee of $700. Thank you. Um, it's different from what I have written in my agenda, but maybe I've got something, maybe I have an old one or something. Um, oh, Karen, can you, th hers is correct? Sorry, I can read the correct one if you'd like. Help Thank you. Trainer. Sorry about that. I was reading off of the, um, the other one. That's, that's okay. <laughs> It's the heat. It's the heat. So the motion, the motion today is that the staff be authorized to issue a license of occupation agreement for applicants who meet the beach vending application requirements for the 2021 beach vending season, and that staff be authorized to charge the seasonal vending fee of $700 for the term ending on September 30th, 2021. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Trainer. That's what I meant to read. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Barkwell? Any further discussion? All in favour? And none opposed. Thank you, Councillor Patton. So that carries. On to 7.2, Ice and Talk Dam Outlet Pipe Replacement. And I believe Chris is going to speak to this. I see your face there. Please Thank you, ahead. Madam Mayor. Uh, so the purpose of this report is to receive information regarding the tender results for the Eisentalk Dam outlet pipe replacement project uh, and to support a capital budget amendment in order to proceed with the project. So in 2020, Council approved borrowing of $2 million for this project for completion in 2021. Uh, the district has since received approval for up to uh, $1.815 million in funding through the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program adaptation, resilience, and disaster mitigation stream, uh, which will significantly reduce the amount of borrowed funds that are required for this project. Uh, we went forward with a tender, which closed on June 15th. We had three submissions that were received 
and the lowest bid was confirmed to be Jim Dent Construction Limited. So the tender price uh, for the actual construction portion of the project came in approximately $400,000 over the budget that was uh, initially developed in 2020 for the grant application uh, and for the 2021 budget. Um, since then, the uh, supply streams for some of the uh, materials such as HDPE pipe, uh, concrete, riprap, we've seen an increase in material costs, um, which have accounted for about $380,000 of that uh, $400,000 increase in cost. Um, however, the district was fortunate to receive a grant to cover the $1.8 million. Um, so we would be looking to reduce the borrowing commitment for the district from 2 million to 600,000 to complete this project. Uh, in the report, there's a summary of the cost for construction uh, for engineering and uh, miscellaneous costs for the slide gate and for contingency, which shows the total project cost of just over $2.4 million and that the funding for that would be the 1.8 from the uh, ICIP grant and the $600,000 from borrowing. Uh, so with that, if there are any questions from council, I'd be happy to answer them now. Thank you, Councillor Barkwell. So this budget and, and these amounts are for the raising the option to raise the dam and increase the, the uh, outflow. Yeah, so, so the, the construction scope right now is to um, replace the outlet pipe and reconstruct the dam to the existing elevation. Um, the engineering costs that include hydrogeological, um, geotechnical and structural reviews. Um, what's going to occur is when we have the excavation open and the existing pipe removed, there's going to be a ge geotechnical investigation done at the base of the dam to confer confirm if raising the dam structure is feasible. Um, so we're going to replace the pipe, rebuild the dam to the existing elevation, but then have information to determine if raising that dam is possible. And the, the dam itself would be constructed in a way that raising that uh, in the future would be an option. So the intent is to come back to council sort of mid construction with that information to determine how we wanna proceed. Um, but there have, there have been discussions recently about uh, potential partnership um, through discussions with the Okanagan Nation Alliance about Trout Creek environmental flows and options within our watershed to store additional water um, where this project to, to raise the dam and that portion of it could be maybe a potential partnership on an additional grant application that may be, may be possible. Great, thank you. Councillor Holmes. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm just wondering with the higher costs, you know, in the, in the, in the past year and, and, and I think this has affected everybody. So we're probably not alone here, but is there any opportunity to go back to the investing in Canada people with new numbers saying, you know, this is the reality and it's no fault of ours because of what's happened in the last year and, and having them to maybe look at it again and perhaps they getting uh, more grant funding to cover that, what the, the original intent was for them to cover. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Holmes. It's a good question. Um, unfortunately, in their, in their program guidelines and in the discussions we had with them, um, they're pretty clear that uh, the approved amount um, is, is, is the upset limit that they're willing to provide. Um, they, they stress that the program is fully allocated and oversubscribed and that recipients of the funding will be responsible for any overages or cost overruns that occur. Um, but it's, it's again, a question that we could, we, you know, we would, we would, could, could go back to them again and ask, but, um, it was laid out even in the grant uh, program at the start before we applied that, that managing project risks and uh, any cost overruns would be the responsibility of us if, if any of those were seen during the project. And follow up, if I may, um, I guess, um, you know, if, 
other municipalities in the province have run into similar things with uh, receiving these infrastructure grants and they're way out of whack and then all of a sudden because of the past year they're way out of whack is it is it a is this an isolated incident or or uh, is this become is this a common a, a recently common pro uh, situation uh, i think it's it's more common recently with with some of the issues, like I said, with the materials and the supply of those materials and the cost increasing. Um, it, yeah, it's always a balance between your grant application, making sure you have all the costs included and a, and a decent contingency, um, but making sure that they're not completely unreasonable and you haven't overpriced your application to the point where uh, it goes against you and it's it's not, uh, you know, it's deemed that you, you, you haven't properly estimated the cost. So um, I don't know if I don't have any specifics of other municipalities with this program specifically recently, if they've experienced the same where their, their estimated costs are a lot lower than what they're seeing on tenders. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, I guess, a risk that's associated with all grant programs where they, they maximize their contribution based on the approved application and whether tender costs come in higher or lower, that's uh, that risk lies on the municipality. Go ahead, Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and through to Councillor Holmes. So first of all, uh, I think it's a good idea. We'll just ask uh, anyway, the grant funding program folks, if there's a possibility to augment our envelope, the worst that could happen is they say no and we would be no worse off than our current allocation. So I think we, we can ask that, although Chris is right around the program criteria for sure. The other thing is uh, what I can say is not only with this project, but with a number of projects in the district and anecdotally talking, talking to other CAOs in the Valley, uh, there has been cost escalation pr primarily due to COVID on a whole bunch of things. And we are experiencing some inflationary pressures uh, on budgets for that reason. So, so uh, that is, that is a true fact. Chris, I have a, I have a couple of questions. Um, looking at the five-year capital plan, it shows that in 2020, there was um, $200,000 allocated and only 23,500 was used. Is this a hundred and is the extra one seventy six five hundred? Is that already factored into the overage, or um, is there are there funds that are unallocated because it wasn't all used last year? Um, so, the, what's shown on there was the estimated actuals uh, in mm -hmm. twenty twenty when the when this uh, the budget was first produced and brought to council, the the final actuals I believe were closer to a uh, hundred thousand dollars, and and that overage or that remaining amount um, was for the design. It, it wasn't carried forward in the in the two million dollar amount for twenty twenty one. So okay, yeah. So there okay. there there is no additional carry forward from twenty twenty that's available. Good. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and then I just had a second question. Uh, it shows in 2022 that there's another $1.4 million associated with this. Is there the opportunity to um, apply for another grant then, do you think? Yeah, that's, that's our hope. Um, it's the, so that's for the spill or the slope protection and spillway upgrades for Eisen Talk. Um, and so we've looked at, um, Part of the part of the resolution is to separate that project um, and have hundred thousand dollars for design in twenty two and show one point three million for construction in twenty twenty three. Right. And our our intent would be to pursue any grant applications or programs that are applicable. Um, but it, yeah, based on the criteria of this current program, um, the spillway and slope protection would would meet that criteria as well. If there's a similar program that rolls out uh, this year or next. Good, thank you. And then one final question. Um, what was my final question? Oh, are both of these projects associated with um, um, 
I guess, findings of the dam safety people? Um, the, so the, the pipe replacement is just due, is mainly due to the condition of the, the pipe and the age and the leaking issues we were having with it. The spill upgrade is, is definitely attributed to the consequence classification of the dam and the required capacity of our spillway based on that consequence classification that we're required. Um, so we're, we're looking to upsize it to meet the requirements of the high consequence classification that has been assigned to Eisentalk. Um, so, so yeah, it, that, that, does, that does align with the regulatory requirements from dam safety. Okay, thanks. And just um, so I understand the high consequences if there was a dam failure, high consequence? Yeah, so they, there's a, a classification for all dams in BC, um, whether it's high, very high or extreme. Um, and with those come different monitoring and uh, operational requirements, um, as well as different volumes and capacities for your spillway that's required based on the potential uh, flow inundation that you may see to that dam to ensure that the spillway is able to release enough water so that that dam will not be overtopped and potentially fail. Great, thank you so much. And uh, the CAO had something to add as well. Well, just further to your question, Madam Mayor, about uh, the dam safety um, observers that we work with from the province. Although it is true what Chris said about the, the pipe replacement being something that we want to do because of the, the age and stage of it. Um, truth would be that if we didn't do the proper maintenance on this pipe and it led to significant leakage and undermining, it wouldn't be long before uh, inspections of those dam safety folks would be compelling us to, to resolve it. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a responsible proactive measure as well that, that is uh, you know, necessary because we're a dam owner. Good. Appreciate that. Thank you, Chris, for taking this proactive measure. It's important. Okay, uh, any other questions for Chris while he's here? Uh, could I have someone bring forward the motion then, please? Anyone? Councillor Barkwell, thank you. I'll start over. I move that the project budget for the Eisentalk Dam Outlet Pipe Replacement Project be revised from $2 million to $2.41586 million, and that the funding be revised from $2 million borrowing <coughs> to $600,000 borrowing plus $1,815,860 from the ICIP dash ARDM grant and that the Eisentalk slope protection and spillway upgrade be shown as a separate project on the water capital budget for $100,000 in 2022 and 1,300,000 in 2023 and that staff prepare a, a bylaw to amend financial plan 2021 to 2025 bylaw number 2021-01 to incorporate these changes. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Van Elfen. Any further discussion on this? All in favor? Uh, good, Councillor Patton, I see your hand raised and there are none opposed, thank you. And thank you again, uh, Chris, for getting, your, um, getting the grant application in and uh, getting this $1.8 million, it <laughs> makes quite a bit of difference in our borrowing. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, on to 7.3, and that is the 2020 annual report, CAO. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm just gonna say a few words of introduction and then actually pass it off to, to Karen to speak to this. But the reason why I wanted to say a few words is not because I had any large part in the heavy lifting associated with this, this annual report. Um, rather, uh, it is actually Karen and her team working with a large group of staff to put together this report. 
And uh, so first of all, I just wanted to recognize that work as it takes a village to raise a, a good annual report. And um, I also wanted to just say, after 20 years of public service doing annual reports, I've never seen one as, as excellent and as easy to read as an inform and as informative as this annual report is fun facts and figures it's a page turner there's pictures in there i think it's actually a document that people are inclined to read i found myself reading all the way through it with interest and uh, i'm proud of it and i'm also proud of the work of staff in a year of pandemic and pressure um, adversity uh, being able to to drive forward on council's priorities and of course council's clear leadership during this difficult time this historic time that we'll all look back to one day uh, together so that's why i wanted to say a few opening remarks but with that I, I will turn it over to karen thank you cao so good afternoon council the annual municipal report is prepared and considered by council each year and includes the 2020 audited financial statements the 2020 tax exemptions provided by council and a report of municipal services and operations for the previous year including objectives and measures for 2020 and into 2021 the report has been posted online for the public for 14 days as required it's been advertised in the summerland review and is available as part of the council agenda package for today so on behalf of corporate services and uh, uh, Graham has already mentioned the number of staff so thanks to all the directors and the staff who contributed to the building of this 2020 annual report we hope that the public finds the report is presented in a way that's informative and celebrates the good work of the district and the resulting community of Summerland thank you thank you Karen council any comments or questions All right, uh, could I have someone bring forward the motion, please, to consider and receive? Thank you, Councillor Trainer. Um, that Council consider and receive the District of Summerland 2020 Annual Report as attached to the report from the Director of Corporate Services dated June 28th, 2021. I just wanted to say this looks really good. I really love all the photos and it's really easy to read, so I, I hope people take a minute to, or a couple minutes to look through it because it's really, it's better than the other ones that we've had done. Not that they were bad, but this one's really easy to read. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trainer. Could I have a seconder, please? Councillor Holmes. Uh, as you know, I think that this, <laughs> this is a, I agree with Councillor Trainer. This is a really um, readable document. I really like the, kind of the standout um, statistics that are at the bottom of several pages. Um, and I've, as I've said before, it's easy to forget when you're sitting at the council table um, how many directions we've given um, that support our, our strategic priorities, of course, but how many directions we've given to staff and then it's kind of, okay, well, that's off our plate. Um, but when you read what has been happening in the last year, especially that difficult year, um, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's amazing what staff has managed to, uh, to get done at a difficult time. So thank you so much. It really is a great presentation. Okay, so um, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that carries. And now, Karen, this is you again, the BC Restart Plan, and as it has to do with council meetings. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So throughout the COVID-19 health and provincial state of emergencies, um, starting in March 2020, council has continued to lead with the health and safety of the community and staff as a top priority. Council had a quick introduction, leading to a very lengthy relationship with the Zoom platform. And this ensured continuity in the business of the district and continued to use technology to ensure remote electronic public participation in open meetings was possible. With the size of our council chamber here at the district and physical distancing requirements, council also held a few in-person public meetings at the arena when public in attendance was not permitted under the health orders. 
Council invested in technology with the help of the province to upgrade the council chamber audiovisual equipment that allows for live streaming and real-time participation in meetings of council. Now as BC moves forward with the restart plan to bring BC back together, local government organizations are planning the transition to in-person public meetings assisted by changes in the legislation. So legislation has been introduced that will allow council and the public to continue to participate electronically in meetings of council. Whereas previous to the pandemic, only special meetings were permitted to be held electronically and there were strict conditions limiting attendance. The second recommendation in the report following the receive for information is therefore to amend the council procedure bylaw to incorporate these broader electronic meeting processes and participation for council committees and the public for all meetings of council and public hearings. Although we're currently in stage two of the restart plan, now and over the next two stages, the public will be permitted to attend public meetings, provided the appropriate health orders are being followed. For Summerland, although the order related to indoor gatherings has changed, the health order still requires physical distancing, which impacts the ability for the district to welcome the public to council chamber in person at this time. This will, however, change once the province enters into stage four of the plan, which is intended to be in early September. For this reason, it is recommended that staff report back on the progress of the restart plan by the end of August, with a plan to welcome the public to council chamber in September of 2021, should BC move into stage four. Sorry, council, just having a, there we go. So the third recommendation is intended to respond in a measured way that respects first and foremost the continuing health orders, but also considers that the shift to less restrictions may affect individuals in different ways. In sum, the recommendations in front of Council today are responsive to the changing health environment and will continue to move the District of Summerland forward with greater accessibility, participation in Council meetings for the public, and it also demonstrates the value in the investment of technology over the past 15 months that will benefit the community into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Any questions, Council? All right, could I have someone bring forward the, the recommendation or some other motion? There's three parts to it. Councillor Holmes. Thank you. Uh, the council received the BC restart plan council meetings report from the director of corporate services dated June 28, 2021 for information and that staff be directed to prepare amendments to council procedure by law number 20, 2018-035 to incorporate broader electronic meeting processes and participation for council and committee meetings and public hearings as permitted under Bill 10, Municipal Affairs Statutes Amendment Act 2021. And that staff report back no later than August 23, 2021 with a transition plan to welcome in-person public attendance at future meetings of council in accordance with the progress of the BC restart plan. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Van Elfen. Any further discussion? All in favour? Great, thank you, Councillor Patton. It's carried unanimously. And then we have a couple of, do we have a couple? Oh, just one bylaw for adoption, and that is the Good Neighbour Bylaw. So this has been through first, second, and third reading already. And uh, Karen can answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, I'll ask someone to bring this forward for adoption, please. Councillor Holmes? For adoption, yeah. And you're seconding. And uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, none opposed. 
And I will ask again, public or media, yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. There is a second bylaw that goes with the Good Neighbor Bylaw for adoption as well. Oh, yes. And that's the bylaw notice enforcement bylaw amendment 2021-024. And you, you're good with that. Councillor Carlson seconding that as well. And we will vote on this second piece. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, for pointing that out. Um, I actually thought maybe you were indicating that there was one person that wanted to speak, but <laughs> good thing I didn't hold my breath on that one. Okay, so uh, council a resolution to close the meeting to the public. Council, oh. yeah, there, there isn't anyone that wishes to speak is what I've heard, yes. Thank you though, Councillor Barkwell. Uh, Councillor Carlson, seconder. 